Today's series has easily the largest cast of all Milestones releases up to this point, and some of the characters get a lot of focus in the comic, some of them get very little focus, but they're all pretty complicated. As such, this script is my third script attempt for Blood Syndicate. So I'm just going to get right into it and try to keep moving, folks. My name is Ben, and this is Comic Book Breakdown episode 22.8, Blood Syndicate. At its core, Blood Syndicate is the story of our main cast, the Blood Syndicate, defending the Dakota neighborhood called Paris Island from a power-hungry madman calling himself Holocaust and his army of bang babies. The meat of this story hamburger is filled out by exploring the cast, their histories, their powers, and those of our bad guy. Paris Island is literally an island. There is a single bridge connecting it to the rest of Dakota, and for years, Paris Island has been overrun by gangs and drugs. Recent events elsewhere in the Milestone universe, mainly Icon and Rocket, have changed that. The heroes have driven out the foreign crime powers, you know, the Russians, the Mafia, the Latinos, the Asians, and crippled the drug trade. This has left local powers... Homegrown gangs like the Blue Street Syndicate, Latin Royale, K-Dragons, and so on. These gangs have been preparing for a war, the winner of it getting to claim the island for themselves. But Holocaust has other ideas. Gifted powers by the Big Bang, Holocaust can manifest flames. He can release them in explosive blasts, or shape them into physical forms like lions or hands, and he seems to be impervious to harm by them. He also seems to have super strength and some amount of invulnerability, but that's a little bit harder to gauge within the comic itself. For the record, Holocaust is a tall, buff black man with a thick beard and long dreadlocks. He is like six foot Five easily, if not bigger, and so it's kind of hard to tell if he has super strength or if he just works out. He certainly looks like he works out. And he does get punched and thrown around quite a bit in the comic while taking very little damage. We're shown a number of flashbacks of Holocaust's childhood throughout the comic, allowing us to know what forces shaped him. As a child, Holocaust's dog lost a dog fight and so his father made him put the dog down. In this life, there is no prize for second place. You're either the strongest one around, or you're dead. Then we see him as a teenager being put through a hold and assess by local police. A white man named Mr. Medina tries to help the teens, pointing out to the cops that this process is unconstitutional. They either need to charge and arrest the boys, or let them go. So the cops beat the ever-loving sh- No swearing! Out of him. This hold and assess was done specifically to intimidate these kids. To teach them that it is the police who have power in Paris Island. Not the law. Not innocence. Holocaust, however, learns the lesson that if you want to be in charge of something, then you need to be able to break it. If you're stronger, then you're the one in charge. Since getting his powers, Holocaust has gathered up a small army of followers. This includes Rebar, who can either generate spikes of Rebar, or who has magnetism powers which he uses to control Rebar, take your pick, Ligero, who appears to have lightning powers or explosion powers, V-R, that's V-E-E space capital R, a woman who can manipulate broadcasts and cast illusions, and even more looser allies, T-Rex and Rat Boy. T-Rex looks like a T-Rex, but smaller, and Rat Boy is a young man who has a rat body now, uh, but like human size, you know. We only see a glimpse of those last two during a recap in issue 5, so they play a very minor role in the overall story, but they are here, and they are nods to the original volume of Blood Syndicate. You might recall 
that Holocaust was last seen recruiting Bang Babies back in the events of the Static comic book, and this is the payoff for that idea. In the meantime, Holocaust and his army have been killing off the other gangs, kidnapping people off the street, and preparing to take over the city. This eventually culminates in a simultaneous attack on police precincts and the remaining gang strongholds. With his main competition eliminated, Holocaust moves to the bridge connecting P.I. to Dakota, and then uses his powers to blow it up. While he's doing all of this in the background of our story, the main focus of the comic is on the heroes of this and how they come together. We are first introduced to the island and its new status quo through the arrival of Rolando Texador and Hannibal White, two natives who are returning home from war. They're met by an old friend, Carlos, and they form the core of what will become Blood Syndicate. The three young men grew up on Paris Island and relied on each other for survival. Hannibal was a member of the Blue Street Syndicate when he was younger, using the streets as a way to escape the oppressive judgment of his father. His best friend was Roland, who grew up a few streets over, in the territory of the Paris Bloods. He should have been a lifelong enemy of Hannibal, but Roland never actually joined a gang. Carlos was the third member of their friendship, but he was closer to Roland than Hannibal. Roland was okay with Carlos being gay, but Hannibal has always been a little bit uncomfortable with it, if not outright hostile. When Hannibal and Roland arrive home and meet Carlos, Hannibal actually splits off to go show his father how much better a person he's become in the intervening years. His life on the streets was dangerous, and it was Roland encouraging him to join the army that actually got him out. That act might have saved his life. And while in the Middle Eastern nation of Sadag, Hannibal has seen the light. He has converted to Islam and found God. We are shown him encountering a young woman in a flashback sequence. This young woman has a scarred right eye and cheek, and she is angry with Hannibal, with this war that his country has brought to hers. All that she ever wanted out of life was to be a teacher, like her parents and their parents before her. But now her beautiful home has been destroyed, and they should both be dead. But they aren't. Alla, for whatever reason, has chosen them both, and they're alive for a reason. Hannibal tries to approach her, wanting to help take care of her injuries, but her good eye glows pink. Guns suddenly rise from the ground and point at him, keeping Hannibal back. Is this telekinesis? Magnetism? I don't know. The flashback ends here, but it clearly had an important impact on Hannibal, leading him to convert. He thinks that finding God is a good thing, regardless of which religion it takes to do it. But his father, called Pops by Hannibal, doesn't agree. As far as he's concerned, Hannibal has been a hellraiser since he was born. He's lied since he could talk, stolen since he could, and preyed upon his own people as a gang member. And now he wants to come back to his house and blaspheme about some harlot that he slept with overseas? But Hannibal argues that it wasn't like that. Pops shuts him down. This is his house. This is God's house. Hannibal will listen to him. But he does not have to listen to Hannibal. This is where Hannibal grabs his hand, which Pops had been shoving a pointed finger into Hannibal's face with, and he forces him to sit down on the couch next to his mother. Who, you'll note, does nothing to defend her son. Yeah, Hannibal did take to the streets, he says, to get away from you. He joined the army to get away from him, too. And if his father is so goddamn righteous, then why did he have to travel halfway around the world to a war zone to find God? Hannibal leaves, ultimately frustrated, and tries to call his girlfriend. Or uh, ex-girlfriend, I suppose. You know, it's complicated. Carol gave birth to their son while he was overseas, and he wants to finally see him. But Carol doesn't want to see Hannibal. He didn't tell her that he was joining the army, he just did it and left. 
left her alone for four years with a child. There was no consideration for her or their relationship when he made that decision. He just left. Hannibal argues that he did send her checks to help take care of the kid, but that doesn't seem to buy much love from her. Suspecting that she has been cheating on him, Hannibal accuses her, and Carol says that she isn't seeing someone, but, you know, what if she was? They were never married. He never proposed. He's the one who left. There's no real relationship here for him to return to, except for what it used to be. Hannibal has returned home to Paris Island, sure, but he isn't the only one who's changed in the intervening time. And in the case of his father, that's a man who hasn't changed at all. Hannibal has nothing to connect him to his home, except for his friends. Roland has been spending this time with Carlos, learning about the attacks on the gangs, the work of Icon and Rocket and the existence of superheroes, and Carlos's own work. He has set up a shelter for bang babies left without homes or who are victims of the gang fighting. Through this, we meet Carlos' sister, Sarah, and then Ligero attacks the shelter. This attack reveals the powers of Carlos, Sarah, and Roland. Carlos is able to phase through solid matter, like Shadowcat of the X-Men. He calls himself Fade. Sarah is able to move through time and calls herself Flashback. Doing some extra research, Sarah is supposed to have a time limit to how far that she can go into either the past or the future, but that is not demonstrated in this particular volume of the comic at all. We see her jump far into the future, uh, we see her jump back to the present, and then later on, she jumps back into the past. It looks to me like she can move freely through time, she just lacks the will to do so. We also meet Aqua Maria, who can turn into water, and Silk, with an E at the end, who appears to be able to make clothing? We don't get to see his powers in action, but he is the one who provides the syndicate with their costumes by the end of the book, and they all look pretty good. He is also Carlos's partner, horrified by the attack on his shelter, but proud of his desire to help people. One of the defining ideas of Paris Island that we get told several times in this comic, is that there is no one coming to help them, so they have to take care of each other. Carlos, and by extension Sarah, tried their best to live this idea. We see a flashback sequence where Carlos, as a young teen, is at the Texador household after taking a bigoted beating from his father. Rolando's parents go to confront his father, and he tries to talk them out of it. He didn't come here because he wanted them to help. That's not what he was trying to do. But they tell him that as far as they're concerned, he's family and they love him. This house is his house too. They have to take care of each other, they say, because no one else will. Roland and Hannibal also have powers of their own, although the source of those powers is unknown. Whatever happened to them, it did happen while they were in Sadag. Rolando is able to either generate his own weapons or teleport them in from another location. It isn't really explained. He just has weapons appear in his hands when he wants them, ranging from things like rocket launchers to handguns to a riot shield at one point. One scene has him blasting Holocaust with this huge energy blast from a gun, and afterwards, Rolando seems tired, like drained from the effort, so I thought that maybe his own life force was powering the gun. But this doesn't quite seem to be backed up by any of the other scenes where he is shown shooting at people, so maybe not. He goes by the codename Tech 9 Hannibal, meanwhile, has super strength and some form of invulnerability. He is shown taking what should be life-threatening damage several times in the comic, but none of it faces him at all. He goes with the codename Wise Son. That core group of characters eventually run into three other surviving gang members. The woman made of stone called Brick, named Marta, a monstrous shapeshifter who was only ever called Trevor, and a Korean man named Pui Chung. Holocaust and his army killed the gangs that they all call family. And now, allied with our main cast, they're going to kill him back. 
as they organize, Icon and Rocket confront Holocaust on the bridge. Remember, Paris Island is where they operate, and it's where Rocket is from. But Rocket's force field does allow light and air through, and so while she is protected from the burning power of Holocaust's flames, he is still able to burn the oxygen in her field. Icon rushes in and saves her from choking to death, but Holocaust has planned for him too. He calls in Perdita, a woman made of gas? Or viruses? She swamps Icon, filling his nose and lungs with as many illnesses as she can. As Icon's body begins to adapt to her, he tells Holocaust as such, he's going to beat this, and then he's going to beat him. And sure, that might be the case, Holocaust says, or maybe she'll find the one thing that finally puts him in the ground. In any case, Icon and Rocket, two of the most powerful characters in the Milestone universe up to this point, are forced to retreat. Holocaust then uses VR's powers to declare himself king of Paris Island. Now, Blood Syndicate shows up, they fight, and Holocaust manages to kill them all. Except for Flashback, who then goes back in time before the fight and warns her friends. They adjust their strategy, attack Holocaust a second time, and this time, they win. Fade manages to pin Holocaust inside the concrete of the bridge at the end, and Tech-9 shoots his head off. Tech then has VR do another broadcast. He addresses the gathered military and police forces that are on the other side of the river. Those forces, and the people that they represent, have never done anything to help Paris Island. And you know what? Paris Island doesn't need them anymore. Anyone who lives here is welcome to come back, but anyone else is going to have to face the Blood Syndicate. Icon and Rocket return, recovered from their earlier attack, and they are impressed by the Syndicate's ability to kill Holocaust. But Icon also advocates against claiming ownership of the island. Tech has V kill the feed and explains himself. He's served with the military. He knows how they pacify occupied territory, and it'll mean lives lost or ruined, martial law, and a variety of other problems. Right now, with the foreign gangs gone and the drugs with them, right now, with the foreign gangs gone, the local gangs killed, the drugs run out of Paris Island, and now Holocaust dead, this is the best chance that Paris Island is ever going to have at a peaceful existence. Tech-9 says that his mother was Haitian. She told him the history of her homeland, and he's thinking of Paris Island as a new Tortuga. Icon, you know, Icon can see his point. It's dangerous, but Rocket is from Paris Island, right? He charges her with the responsibility for this people. Don't screw it up. And then Icon leaves. Rocket is annoyed at having to babysit these guys, but she knows Paris Island. If you don't do what needs to be done yourself, no one will. She warns the syndicate that her mother still lives here, so she'll be watching them. And then she flies off herself. Hannibal looks at Tech once she's left. Hey, man, what's a blood syndicate? Whew. <sighs> Floop duping. That is the first time that I've summarized this comic that I feel like I did a good job. Oy. Let's start with the characters. I explained Holocaust deals first in the summary as he's easily the main villain of the book, and I think that he works really well. He's physically intimidating, his powers are very cool looking and dramatic, and he's kind of a big talker. He speeches a lot in the comic, which at one point is actually a bit maddening for me, because when he fights Icon, he calls him out on doing more talking than fighting. But then, as Icon is choking on germs, Holocaust spends the next two pages gloating about it. <sighs> but Holocaust is charismatic, his background elements perfectly explain why he is the way he is, and that stuff's great. I am actually super surprised that he was killed at the end of this comic, as he was such a good villain. And my research into the first Milestone universe 
indicates that Holocaust was kind of a big deal. He had his own four-issue miniseries at one point, for Stanley's sake. And then you just kill him off in his first outing? Yeah, all right. I mean, they're, they're your comic book's milestone. The rest of the villains in this comic are uninspired and don't do much for me, but I will also freely admit that they don't really need to. They're meant to indicate how dangerous Holocaust is, you know, demonstrating that despite their own powers or monstrous looks, this relatively normal-looking dude is the one who's in charge of them. They're henchmen, for the most part, and I do think that they hench successfully. I wouldn't have minded some more dialogue cues or exposition boxes, giving me a bit more of an idea who they are, though. If I have any real complaint about them, it would be that. Classically, when you read a comic book, especially a superhero comic book, there will be dialogue cues introducing who a character is and what they can do. So, like, we meet Rebar first, right? And he is called Rebar in conversation, which is fine, but then he doesn't demonstrate his power at all until issue, until issue 6. And then he does so in a crowded fight scene while he is off-panel, so it's hard to tell what's going on. And then we get no other explanation for his powers. I have the same problem with Ligero, who appears to self-detonate like a Voltorb in his first appearance, but then later on he is shown attacking drones with lightning strikes or making them explode from a distance. So does he control lightning? Does he control explosions? The comics don't really tell me. And actually, this is true of almost everyone in the comic. We're told very little about their powers. I don't know if Tech-9 is creating those weapons or summoning them. I don't know if Trevor can turn into any shape that he chooses or just monsters, as he is shown as a giant snake at one point and a giant dragon at another. Uh, I don't know if Silk is a designer who just happens to get clothing creation abilities, or is that some kind of package deal where he got clothing creation abilities, which then made him a designer? I mean, I don't even know what Pui Chung does. At some point, Ligero hits him with what looks like lightning, and he appears to absorb the energy, but then, like, he hulks up with it. Pui Chung gets bigger, more muscular, and his skin glows with blue-white energy. It also bothers me that I do have characters like Trevor or Pui Chung who don't even get code names in the length of this comic. That's like Superhero 101. You tell me their names, you tell me their code names, and you tell me what they can do. This simple feature is what allows me to know what is going on in a crowded book like this one, and to find characters that I like. That's what's going to keep me around. Good characters. But I don't understand half of what's going on with this cast. The half that I do understand is pretty solid. I like Hannibal, Roland, and Carlos a lot. I like their dynamic. I like that they don't all get along with each other. Uh, I really like that drama of it. But I love that they still support each other, despite those arguments. There are several scenes in the comic of Carlos and Hannibal having trouble with each other because of Hannibal's prejudice against Carlos being gay. But Carlos never stops reaching out to Hannibal. And he does call Hannibal out on his bullsh for sure, so it's not like he's just taking it either. And Hannibal does trust Carlos to fight alongside him, so that dislike can't run too deep. But it is there, and it needs to be worked through as an ongoing part of the comic book, and again, I like that. Hannibal as a character is extremely flawed here at the beginning in terms of he's got this huge temper, especially when he's talking with Carol. Of course, he has his bad relationship with Carol. He's got his bad relationship with his father. He's got this slightly contentious relationship with Carlos. And all of that is stuff that can be worked through as the comic goes on. That, to me, is a super good bit of writing, given that Hannibal is somebody who claims to have found God. And as such thinks that he's a better person than he used to be. He even goes to his father to prove it. But he still hasn't accepted this facet of his friend yet, so he's judging Carlos in much the same way that his father has judged him. Hannibal might believe in God, and he might have found faith in a higher power, 
But he isn't quite done with his spiritual journey yet. He's still got a lot of growing and self-reflection to do. Roland easily feels like the leader of the cast, and he's the character that I personally liked the most. We see a flashback of him defending himself from the gangs when he was a kid, we see his family helping out Carlos, and Roland is the one who got Hannibal to join the military. He does his best to take care of people, like his family taught him to do. And as a former military veteran, he is also the one calling the shots in the field. I would argue that Carlos and Roland are kind of like co-leaders, as Carlos has set up some outreach after the Big Bang, and he is the one who connected most of these Bang Babies together. Roland just kind of gets to show up after the fact and then provide them with tactics when they go into a combat situation, so uh, there's a balance there to be figured out. Sarah and Aqua Maria are a step back in character importance, and they do get less work than the men. Both of them are critically important to the plot, and they also fulfill great roles in the team. Aqua Maria is a great spy, traveling quickly around Paris Island thanks to the sewer system. She's also skilled at watching people. She is the only person in the comic who realizes that Roland and Hannibal have superpowers, but weren't present for the Big Bang. There's something else happening there, and she's the only one who sees it. Maria is also the one who douses the flames of male bullishness when Carlos and Roland or Hannibal begin to butt heads, reminding them that they're still friends and that they need to work together. When Roland sees Sarah again for the first time, she rushes into a big hug with him and she is talking a mile a minute. Carlos and Sarah both speak Spanish quite often throughout this comic, and she just rattles off a paragraph at Roland rapid fire. The way that Carlos tries to calm her down kind of makes me think that Sarah might have a crush on Roland? Or maybe Carlos just suspects that she does. It's likely that this is my own personal interpretation, as it's kind of countered by the first time that we see Sarah use her powers. When Ligero attacks the firehouse and then explodes, Carlos shouts for Sarah to get out, and she turns purple and disappears into the time stream. She sees Roland and Hannibal and Sadak briefly, surrounded by flames and ruins. Then she appears at the Black Lives Matter protest that led to the Big Bang. And then finally, she appears, standing next to a woman in ornate, colorful armor. This woman seems to recognize Sarah, calling her flashback. They're caught in the middle of some huge battle, and I mean a crossover-style battle, folks. We can see hardware, static, icon, and rocket fighting what appears to be uh, Aztec warrior gods? I gotta say, that is not something I was expecting to see in the Milestone universe. The woman says that Sarah needs her armor, she can't be here without it, but Sarah is obviously freaking out. In a panic, she scream asks what is happening, and the armored woman finally understands what's going on. This isn't her Sarah. At least not yet. A bright flash of light blinds them both, and then a, uh, a half-man, half-bat in armor and robes stands before them. He calls the armor woman his sister, and warns that no matter how many humans she befriends, he's still going to win. He has waited too long, planned too well. The armored woman shoves Sarah back away from him. She needs to leave. Warn Carlos. Warn everyone. They need to beware the demon fox. But her voice fades as Sarah returns to the modern day and age. The demon fox is an enemy from the original run of Blood Syndicate, and this armored woman is most likely the character named Kwai. It would seem that Milestone is teasing some kind of large-scale crossover event, and I'm not sure how I feel about that right now. Out of all of Milestone's books, I think that the Syndicate does some of the best work regarding the shared universe concept. If you read Static, then you have some idea of where Holocaust got his start and how he found his army. If you read Icon and Rocket, then you know that they kicked the foreign drug powers out of Paris Island. If you hadn't read those books, well that's okay, as this comic does do the work necessary to introduce those ideas, they just don't connect the background elements as well. 
keeping them largely in the background works best for me. Consider how blatant the connections were between static and hardware, or hardware and icon and rocket, or even static and icon and rocket. None of the connective ideas there lined up well or reflected each other properly. They all felt, well, not quite forced, but not quite figured out either. But using such ideas as background elements in Blood Syndicate, it's okay if the edges are a little bit fuzzy. We're not focused on them enough to look for any of the details. We are much more focused on our cast and their story. So sure, Holocaust has been recruiting people since the Static comic, and we don't know how long a time period that's been, but it doesn't really matter, because we know what Holocaust has been up to in that time. Same thing for Icon and Rocket. We don't know how long they've been operating for, but we do know that they kicked the powers out of Paris Island. So this story has to take place after their own comic book, but at an unknown time period. And that's okay, because we know the end result of what happened there, so it all works. Even when this story does have an overt connection, like having Holocaust defeat Icon and Rocket, it doesn't contradict anything that we saw in their own comic book, and it really helps this book. If you read their comic, then you know how strong, adaptable, and intelligent those two are. And if Holocaust is able to take them down, then he is a legit danger. However, if you hadn't read their book, Holocaust is still able to demonstrate his intelligence and planning and power. It works fairly well either way. This, to me, is easily one of the best shared universe scenes out of all of these books. Finally, we have this peek into the future of the Milestone comics. If you hadn't read Static, Hardware, or Icon and Rocket by this point, then guess what? You're going to have no idea who those other characters portrayed in that flashback are. And that's bad enough, because it does show other members of the Blood Syndicate, like Pui Chung, and a woman with, like, metal wings who appears on the cover of issue 3, but doesn't appear in any of the comic books at all. I do not know who she is supposed to be. There are no exposition boxes identifying them during the battle. There's no dialogue where someone says, Static, watch out! And then Static replies, Thanks, Hardware! We do see Icon and Rocket in this comic, so I mean, that provides some context for who they are. But if you don't know that these books are part of a shared universe, then you're kind of just left confused by this scene. If you had read those comics, then you do get to see the scale of the Demon Fox's threat. This guy, whatever he's supposed to be, is dangerous enough to warrant the attention of not just the Blood Syndicate, but Milestone's biggest names and some of their most popular characters. This is a thing. But now my attention is on that thing, you know? I want answers about the Demon Fox conflict now, and I don't really care about what's going on in this comic anymore, to be quite honest. Thankfully, author Jeffrey Thorne knows that this flash-forward is really distracting, and so he put it at the start of the series. We see this little teaser, and then Sarah drops right back into a fight scene, we then meet Aquamaria saving her for the first time, and then we are put back on track for the rest of the comic. And honestly, I had kind of forgotten that this flash-forward scene had happened by the time I got to the end. Perhaps the only place where the shared universe idea really fails the book is in Holocaust's destruction of the bridge to Paris Island. You might remember that during the events of Icon and Rocket, four superpowered weirdos blew up the bridge in order to draw the attention of Icon and Xiomara. Well, that bridge appears to be the same bridge that we see here. But, I mean, it's fine. Well, it was fine before Holocaust blew it up. This does create that little disconnect for me. We are constantly told by Paris Islanders that no one takes care of the island. They're largely left to fend for themselves. But if that's the case, then who fixed the bridge? And who did it so quickly? I think that a project like that would take months, but it certainly doesn't feel like that much time has passed since the Icon and Rocket comic. This is absolutely a minor blip in the continuity of the books, and in the totality of the comic, it really doesn't stand out much. But 
when it's taken as part of the overall universe, it is still a hiccup. As I mentioned, Blood Syndicate was written by Jeffrey Thorne. Looking at his work history, Thorne is a pretty accomplished writer. He's done a handful of novels, a bunch of comic anthologies, and he's written for quite a few TV shows. He wrote for Law & Order, Criminal Intent, Leverage, Ben 10 Ultimate Alien, and Omniverse, the Spider-Man Web Warrior show, Avengers Assemble Secret Wars, the latest Magnum P.I., and Power, colon, Book 2, colon, Ghost. That's a solid writing history. Thorne has also written a number of comics, including some books for DC and a handful for Marvel, of which I'm a little bit more familiar than the rest of his work. I was surprised to see that I had read some of those comics, specifically the 2016 series called Solo. I won't go into details about that book now, but I mean, I did thoroughly enjoy it. I thought it was a good read. It was fun. He also wrote one of the Inhuman comics, Mosaic, which I own, but still haven't read yet. But that is a pretty good bibliography. There's no really high-profile books yet, to my personal tastes, but there is a solid history of work nonetheless. Knowing that, I think that he did a really great job here. He juggled a very large cast, fleshed out enough of the characters to invest me in them and leave me wanting more regarding the rest, and overall the story made sense. It reads way more complicated than I explained it, with scenes cutting between characters or time periods for flashbacks or flash forward or flash forwards, but Thorne makes sure that we understand the context of what's happening incredibly well. I never once felt confused from a story construction standpoint, like I was in hardware. There are mysteries presented within the comic, and they are left unanswered by the end of it, and obviously those left me scratching my head, but in a good way in a way that I would be willing to pay for a sequel series. I would appreciate a little more Claremontian-style exposition regarding some character names and powers. If I gotta knock Thorn for anything, I'm gonna knock him for that. The pencils for this comic are handled by Criss Cross. He helped with layouts on Static, but that book was mostly drawn by Nicholas Draper Ivy. Here... Criss Cross does it all, baby, and that makes me super happy. I've liked Criss Cross's artwork since I personally first saw it on Slingers, released by Marvel in 1998. He also did some amazing artwork for Captain Marvel with author Peter David in 1999, and he worked on a volume of Firestorm for DC in 2004. I actually have that, and I started reading it, and then I just kind of fell off, but again, his artwork looks great. Working on Blood Syndicate is a bit of a homecoming for him, though, as working on the initial volume in the early 90s is what got him started in the industry. Hopefully, this was an exciting homecoming for him, because I was certainly excited for him. Criss Cross has a fairly animated style, managing to keep a fine balance between fluid animated forms and realistic bodies and faces. When I look at Maria, even in her water form, her proportions and body shape look like Maria, and somehow she manages to look Spanish to me. Everybody has a distinct face, and everyone has their own unique look. I especially like the costumes for the Syndicate, once they've all debuted by the end of the comic. There's a bit of a unifying theme, in that almost all of them wear face masks, except for Flashback and Aqua Maria. Why they don't, I'm not sure, but I do like the idea of these characters hiding their faces. The Syndicate is a group of vigilantes at best, and outlaw criminals at the worst, so hiding who they are makes sense in a very classic comic book fashion. If there is a downside to their looks, it's that Tech 9, Wise Son, Fade, Flashback, and Aqua Maria all look like professional superheroes, while Brick, Trevor, and Pui Chung just look like people who walked in off the street. They don't look like a team at all. And I do think that the cast would be okay with that. When Holocaust challenges them during the fight verbally, he refers to them as superheroes, and I can't remember if it was Tech Nine or Wise Son who replies something along the lines, who said we were superheroes? And then they kill him, which is something that superheroes don't do in more traditional comics. They... This group of characters isn't a team, they're a family. 
And if you don't want to consider them a family, well, then they're a gang. There are a few minor artistic problems that I have. For example, I don't understand VR's look at all from a concept standpoint. She has on these big flowing sleeves and pant legs like they're poofy curtains, but they leave her thighs and upper arms totally exposed. Similarly, her top has a circle cut out of the middle, the bottom that she wears is like a bathing suit, but then she's got like a a cloth wrap around her waist. Like, what is she trying to be, a fortune teller from a carnival, but with with sci-fi powers? Someone who does aerial cloths? I don't understand what this is meant to tell me. Similarly, Holocaust spends most of the comic wearing a red, white, and black jumpsuit. It's not an impressive-looking jumpsuit, but the red and white speak to fire for me, and the black in it speaks to ash, so sure, why not? I would say that this kind of works. But when Holocaust declares himself king, he switches to a more comic book-y costume with a, a small vest over the top and a fire crown. And I don't know how he does that. When V starts her broadcast, he is wearing his jumpsuit look. And then when he says, hey, I'm king, he's suddenly in his comic book clothes. He doesn't remove the jumpsuit. He doesn't burn it off, which would have been really dope reveal. He's just suddenly in a different costume. And then this actually happens again when the syndicate attacks him the second time. We're shown his big announcement in his king outfit, but then they smack him off of the bridge, and he's back in the jumpsuit. And, earlier in the comic, Tech-9 shoots Holocaust, like, point-blank in the chest in issue 3 or 4, and Holocaust is just fine. He's winded by the attack, sure, but he's still alive. But then, Tech-9 shoots him in the head here in issue 6, and it just... Like, Pops? Why was he invulnerable in one scene, but not in both of them? Was his head just, like, his weak point? I mean, I suppose shooting most of us in the head is our weak point, but it's just inconsistent, right? Finally, we have Juan Castro and Sean Damian Hill on Inks, both names that I am not super familiar with, and Will Quintana did Colors. Quintana is a name that I am familiar with, as he worked on CrossGen's Sigil. We haven't talked about Sigil on the show yet, but it was the sci-fi war comic in CrossGen's lineup, and Quintana's work there was a huge part of what made it work for me. I would also like to give a special shout-out to artist Tom Rainey, who did the flash-forward scene, uh, where we met Kwai and the Demon Fox for the first time. I don't know if Tom Rainey worked on the original Milestone comics at all. I didn't see a mention of it doing my research for this episode, but it does lend a different style, and it makes it feel like it's a different moment from the rest of this comic. Between its compelling characters and some really great artwork, Blood Syndicate has earned its place in my top three for Milestone's comics. Icon and Rocket take the top spot, I think Blood Syndicate is probably my second favorite, and then Static, with Hardware and Duo bringing up the rear. You know, I was not expecting Blood Syndicate to do so well when I first saw it announced. Like, this to me was the book I was probably looking forward to the least. Especially when you consider how hyped I was for Greg Pak on Duo, this is a real dark horse win for Blood Syndicate. We have finally covered all of the comics related to Milestone's return. (sighs) And I'm glad that we did. This has been a fun universe to explore. I've gotten to learn a lot about the books, their casts, and their history, which I'm always down for, and I hope that you did the same, dear listener. We aren't quite done yet, as next week we'll be wrapping up this series of episodes with my final thoughts about Milestone. There are a few ideas that I haven't had time to explore in other episodes yet. There is a setup for one of the upcoming Milestone books that I want to talk about, and I will cover the rest of what Milestone has planned for 2023 as well. Join me in a week for Comic Book Breakdown episode 22.9, Departing Dakota. Eh, for now. 
Everyone, there are a million podcasts vying for your time and attention, and I'd like to thank you for listening to mine. If you would like to get in touch with me to share a concern, request a series, compliment me, berate me, whatever you like, send me an email at cbbreakdown at gmail.com. Otherwise, thanks for listening. <laughs>